Fran this Tuesday from Sydney. Fran, on the land of the Gadigal people. Hi, Greg. How's it going? What a day, hey? It has been another busy one. Uh, day two, in fact, although it feels like an eternity ago now. Fran, since Scott Morrison made that drive, they've covered a bit of ground, it must be said. Anthony Albanese today started uh, from Tasmania, then moved across to Melbourne. Scott Morrison's been working the factories and footpaths of Western Sydney. He, of course, in the hunt for Labor-held seats of Parramatta and Macquarie. Here's how their day looked condensed. Back in Parramatta. <laughs> Job creation promising more than a million new jobs between now and 2027. Hawks Brewing Company, what's that like? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good brew. He says that he believes the coalition is better placed to handle Australia's economy. And it won't be easy under Albanese. He's going to have to defend his economic credentials. Oh, look, I've seen lots of stumbles over the years from politicians on both sides. I took responsibility. That is what I will do. From time to time, if ever I make a mistake, I'll own it and I'll accept responsibility. This does cast doubt over how Labor would manage the economy if the leader can't recall these kinds of economic indicators. My theory is, shake it off. <laughs> All right, so between them, Fran, these leaders covered five events in three states, by my counting anyway, and that's just today. At face value, Fran, Scott Morrison wanted to talk about a five-year jobs target that he's setting for the coalition, but very conveniently, it also provided an easy pivot across to Anthony Albanese's failure yesterday on the unemployment rate. That's exactly right, Greg. All day today, really all morning, the Prime Minister flanked by, in particular, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, talking about jobs, how many jobs they would create if they're re-elected. That's 1.3 million in five years, which, by the way, is pretty much the current rate of jobs creation anyway. Um, but every time they could do that and mention the unemployment rate of 4%, it was a tacit reminder that Anthony Albanese didn't know that number when he was asked yesterday. Now, you know, Scott Morrison was saying, oh, well, people make mistakes, but then he hammered home the point that it wasn't just that Anthony Albanese didn't remember. Fair enough, you might put that down to campaign nerves. But if he didn't know their jobless rate, he didn't know, to quote, to sort of paraphrase Maxwell Smart, I suppose, yes. he didn't... Um, <laughs> he wasn't just out by a long shot. He, he didn't miss it by just that much. Oh, he didn't know the number. But he didn't miss it by that much. He missed it by that much. And what matters about that is he thought unemployment had a five in front of it, not even a four in front of it. And it's going to a number with a three in front of it. And what that tells me is his working assumptions about our economy and what Australians are achieving in our economy, he doesn't know. He's got no idea. This is a tough job and it won't be easy under Albanese. Thank you very much. All right, so Scott Morrison in full flight. We thought we might get a sense, though, Fran, from inside the Morrison campaign bus, as we call it. So we caught up just a few minutes ago with our travelling reporter, Stephanie Boris, who just pulled up then at event number three for the Prime Minister. That was in Sydney. <laughs> Steffi, it's been a long day already, but where's your magical mystery tour taking you with Scott Morrison this afternoon? Good afternoon, Greg. Well, we've spent all of today in Sydney's west, and now we're in the seat of Lindsay, which is held by Liberal's Melissa McIntosh. Now, while the political information may be interesting for some, other viewers may be wondering what exactly is going on behind me. We're at Assistance Dogs Australia, and the government has announced that they will provide $2 million to the charity to help ensure ensure that more of these dogs can be trained for people who have PTSD as a result of being in the Defence Force and also children with a disability. Now, this scene that we're seeing here, Greg, is very different to the rest of what we've done today. Scott Morrison earlier this morning visiting two other seats in Western Sydney. Both of those are actually held by Labor on a very slim margin. And they were both visits to manufacturing companies. Yep, so we're noticing embedded back behind you not only AFP security officers, <laughs> 
Ministers, but there's a Foreign Minister in there, Steffi, and a Prime Minister as well. What about those who attend these events? What are you noticing about the nature of campaign coordination so far? I guess the question is just how controlled or controlling is this setup? Well, any election campaign, Greg, is quite controlled, as you would well know, but this one is particularly interesting so far in that we haven't actually done any public events in terms of mingling with the general public. All events so far have been tightly controlled at either businesses or charities where the general public is not allowed in. So there's been quite a wonderful reception that the Prime Minister has received, and we are expecting him, though, in the weeks ahead, of course, to try and do street walks or maybe visit a pub. Those, of course, though, Greg, are quite hard to control. Control. You never quite know what you're going to get. And at the moment, the government is more keen to keep this clean message coming through about the economy and about jobs, especially given uh, what we've seen on the Labor leader's side with the economic gaffe that yeah. he made yesterday. Well, I was going to take you up on that and observing, as I do, that it's very hard to control animals. So there might be a bit of risk attached to uh, this particular event. But just on that point, Steffi, it was conspicuous that Scott Morrison had Josh Frydenberg his treasurer with him this morning. Could they resist the urge to make merry over Anthony Albanese's gaffe of yesterday? Yeah, we heard both the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, and the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, talk about uh, the fact that Mr Albanese couldn't answer pretty basic economic questions yesterday. And that really fed into what the government's messaging has been, and that is that the government believes it's the proper party to run uh, the Australian government and the Australian way, saying that, you know, we are still living in uncertain times and it's the coalition that is better placed to handle the situation at the moment. So, as you mentioned there, it's not just the Treasurer Josh Frydenberg that's been with Scott Morrison today, but the Foreign Minister Maurice Payne as well. That's interesting in itself that you're starting to see Scott Morrison surround him with some of his uh, closest and most senior ministers within his government too. He's trying to portray a picture of a very united team, a team that um, the Australian public can trust because they've been around for so long compared to the opposition. The dogs are barking. Stephanie Boris, we're going to let you go and uh, get out of their way. Thanks, Greg. OK, so Fran's about to skip across and take a look at the Labor campaign, but just to get us there, Anthony Albanese will quickly summarise, started by making an announcement in northern Tasmania of a 30-odd million dollars worth of Medicare bulk billing services. That's for regional telehealth psychiatric consultations. Uh, but there was, as we've already discussed, some explaining to do after yesterday's memorable start to the campaign. I've said uh, clearly uh, that it was a mistake uh, I had a mistake. Uh, I, I made it. Uh, I've uh, I fessed up to it. I've owned it. I'm not dismissing it. Well, I, I made a I, I made a mistake. I'm not trying to analyse it. I, I'm owning it. You need to learn something new every day. And the second is you need to get better uh, every day. Uh, that is the philosophy as a, as a person as well in how you relate to people. Uh, so you have to grow as a person. You have to grow as a person, or as you said later, uh, quoting Taylor Smith, you've got to shake it off. And uh, the rest of the Labor team, I think, are desperately hoping that Anthony Albanese can shake this off, Greg, because it has dogged him now for almost this entire second day of the campaign. You heard him there. He's still acknowledging he made a mistake. I, I've lost count of how many times he's said that so far. They're going to want to try and move this on. You know, Labor's got a, a policy announcement that they've made today. We'll be talking about that with the Labor campaign spokesperson, Shadow Finance Minister um, Katie Gallagher, shortly. Um, but really, can he move move beyond this morass. Well, let's check in now with the Albanese bus. Tom Lowry is there. Tom, hi there. Okay, friend. Could see you on the bus there. I remember those days. Um, look, we heard, uh, <laughs> we heard Scott Morrison earlier really just basically taking pot shots at Anthony Albanese with jibes like, it won't be easy under Albanese. What's the mood like there in that uh, Albanese camp after yesterday's very problematic day for Anthony Albanese? 
I think the Prime Minister stole that one directly from the Daily Telegraph. But look, today in the Albanese camp really has been about shaking it off. It's been about dealing with that issue from yesterday and trying to move, move past it and regain a little bit of confidence too. Uh, it has been a better day for the Albanese camp. They have sort of tried to deal with it very directly, as you saw uh, Anthony Albanese out there spruiking his economic credentials, acknowledging it was a serious mistake, but calling it just a mistake, and also turning around and getting back on the attack as well even going after the government over its own economic record, mentioning things like forecasts of wages growth that have never eventuated. So they are trying to regain that confidence. But you can't, you shouldn't you know, understate how significantly this has knocked Anthony Albanese's confidence. If you contrast the Anthony Albanese you saw yesterday morning doing breakfast television interviews, who was bright and bubbly and happily, happy and very excited to be on the campaign, to what you saw immediately after that press conference yesterday, you know, that was a very different figure. He is looking better today. He's enjoying himself more. He's just been at the uh, Father Bob Foundation here in Melbourne, in South Melbourne, and, you know, seems to be enjoying himself getting back onto the campaign trail. Yeah. That being said, just as I walked out of that event, you know, a, a punter pulled me up and said, you know, who was that? What was that going on? I said, oh, it's, you know, Anthony Albanese in town. And they said to me, look, you know, make sure don't ask him the unemployment rate or the cash rate. So there are certainly some people out there, you know, taking note of the campaign and, and what's going on. So these things do, do cut through. Yeah, it's got through. I love it that you're on the bus and you're actually moving, Tom, to talking with us that's fantastic um, but yeah it's an old <laughs> adage really you know if you don't believe in yourself how can you convince the voters to believe in you and vote for you that's going to be the challenge for Anthony Albanese but you've definitely detected that he's back on the front foot what's been uh, they've had some policy today what is that what's the basis of that yeah, Labor has been trying to focus on health care, you know, primarily for the past, cu past couple of days. Uh, the announcement today was, uh, you know, $31 million for telehealth services to boost regional telehealth services, you know, reinstating some Medicare funding there. You know, of course, the healthcare focus hasn't really cut through anywhere near as much as Labor would have liked compared to the economic issues that over have overshadowed it. But we've seen a, you know, perhaps a return to cost of living stuff as well, visiting the Father Bob Foundation here in Melbourne and having chats directly to Father Bob about the cost of living, who's making the point to him that it's, you know, in these kinds of places where they sort of, you know, serve food to, you know, Australia or Melbourne's most needy people, that the price of a loaf of bread or the price even of a, a can of beans really matters. So, uh, you know, Labor is trying to turn the conversation back towards that safer territory. This is, you know, good labour ground to be on, but I don't always get to control the agenda. I'm sure that's, you know, part of the challenge of the next few days is getting back to talking about what they want to be talking about in this campaign. Yeah, just don't let them ask him the price of bed, big bread because that is, you know, fraught with danger. Tom, thanks very much. Good luck on the trail. Thanks, friend. Yeah, so friend, uh, we're always loath to uh, make too much of body language interpretation. Uh, but even so, it's fascinating when you get in the campaign context with reporters moving in really close quarters with these leaders, just how much they do in fact pick up on, on confidence or what some people might broadly describe as the vibe. These are confidence players after all, political leaders. Well, that's right, you know, and Anthony Albanese, I understand, well, and, and understandably, was very knocked last night, was, you know, feeling just terrible about not being able to answer that question. He should have been able to answer that question. It's give, given the government, the Prime Minister, really another free run today, as I say, is sort of making Albanese, Anthony Albanese the butt of jokes almost. But with that more serious point, which goes directly, as we said yesterday, to the Prime Minister's key narrative, which is don't risk voting for this other lot, and now he can say, because this guy doesn't, need how, doesn't even know how many of you are on the unemployment queue. I think it was, I mean, it's... It's safe to say, I think, a very sort of dangerous gaffe from Anthony Albanese yesterday, and it all goes to how he can get back on that front foot and try and get this campaign back onto Labor's territory, which is, you know, childcare, aged care, Medicare, Labor cares. That's their theme. Yeah. And we'll be talking to Katie Galler about some of that a little later. Yeah, exactly. Why don't we get some government perspective, not so much on Anthony Albanese, but on other issues of the day now, Fran. Thanks so much, because Anne Rustin is Social Services Minister, but she's also juggling a few extra responsibilities throughout the campaign. In fact, within a few days, she could even be given a new job in the event of a coalition victory on the 21st of May. She joined us here a short time ago. Well, Anne Rustin, thanks for joining us on Afternoon Briefing. You're wearing a few hats at the moment. I guess technically you're probably here as campaign spokeswoman, but uh, we also have the Prime Minister promising that in 
not too many days, he'll be able to announce Greg Hunt's replacement as Health Minister. Uh, is that something you'd be interested in or have been approached about? Well, I mean, I will serve in whatever capacity the Prime Minister asks me to serve um, in, his, in his government uh, or in his cabinet. Uh, but obviously we're all going to have to wait until the weekend to find out um, his decisions in relation to this particular appointment. Do you maintain a policy interest in health, or have you, over the years? Um, look, I, I've got very broad policy interest. You know, be, having been a small business person, obviously I've got a very strong interest in the economic issues, particularly those that, that impact on small business. Uh, but equally, you know, I understand the importance of essential service and none more essential than health uh, to Australians. And so, uh, yes, I have, a, I have a deep interest in, in many areas of, uh, of government. And it's definitely the government's intention to put this one to rest, to fill the Greg Hunt vacancy publicly in the next few days? Yes, I think the Prime Minister said on a number of occasions that his intention is to make the announcement about who will be the person to replace uh, Greg Hunt sometime in the next few days. All right, now look, on the health front, I might get you to respond to a Labor policy announcement that Anthony Albanese has been out pushing today. This is to restore uh, telehealth regional loading of 50% uh, for psychological uh, consultations. Why was that abolished in in the first case, that was just at the end of last year. It was initially, I think, a pandemic measure, but um, this policy, apparently worth uh, about three, $31 million, um, does it seem worthy on face value? Well, I mean, I think the, the thing to say here is this is just another embarrassing gaffe by Mr Albanese. Um, clearly, um, he hasn't done his research or his homework when it comes to this particular announcement because nothing could be further from the truth than some of the things that he's been saying this morning um, about this particular policy that he's talking what about. What specifically was incorrect? Well, first of all, um, this government, the government of which I am a member of, have continuously increased um, telehealth. I mean, there have been massive increases in telehealth uh, particularly through the pandemic. We've seen you know, a nearly 35% increase in telehealth consultations since uh, you know, year on year from last year. But what this is actually referring to um, is something that was in place well before the pandemic in relation to telehealth about setting up the infrastructure so telehealth could occur. We have made an absolute commitment that telehealth will be permanent and universal and that includes for, for psychiatric appointments as well as mental health appointments. Um, and but so does it include this 50% regional loading, which at least according to the Labor policy documentation uh, suggests that that was discontinued late last year? By putting it back on, they say there are hundreds of thousands of consultations that would be facilitated with this loading. Yeah. Are you disputing that too? Well, what I would say is they do need to go and do their homework. What are they referring to is around um, support that was given to establish um, the telehealth um, infrastructure. Uh, it was something that was done well before the pandemic. And as we all know, with the emergence of things like Zoom and Teams, and I mean, you can do a telehealth appointment on your phone these days. Um, it was a recommendation of an expert panel. And this just goes for another time where Mr Albanese is disregarding the advice of the experts to make some sort of headline grabbing announcement that he hasn't done the homework on and is not providing accurate information. And what I would say is that I think it is pretty disgusting that people in rural and regional areas are now going to think that somehow they're not going to be able to get access to these really important services. They are. They've been increased under the government. And so I think he really does need to think about what he's doing here. So is there no particular or unique problem when it comes to access by regional patients to psych psychiatric services via telehealth? Because it does appear that this might uh, provide some extra incentive, for instance, for the uh, psychiatrist to take on that caseload from country areas. Is that not a problem at all? Well, as I said, we have, under this government, made an announcement that we are going to make telehealth um, universal and permanent. We've increased the amount of funding that's been made available to it. There's been a massive increase in uptake about using this as a mechanism by which to get consultations. And that includes continuing to make sure that we've got increased access um, to mental health services by this mechanism. Right. There has been no cut. There has been 
no cut. All right, we might take that up with Labor. Can we take you to your own policy announcements today? A little bit of a, a recompilation of government initiatives to drive towards a five-year objective of 1.3 million jobs. But at about 250,000 jobs per year, isn't that just status quo? You don't have to actually do much at all to achieve that target. Well, look, not at all. One of the things that we have absolutely committed to is investing in the skills that Australians need to make sure that they are able to take up the new jobs. Uh, you know, as we know, there's a very tight labour market at the moment and the expectation is there are going to be more jobs into the future. So we need to make sure we're skilling Australians. Our $2.1 billion job trainer program um, is already training 330,000 Australians with uh, and that money goes towards 485,000 Australians. But they're not just um, training, they're in training in areas that we know there is going to be and there already is a really strong demand, whether that be aged care, disability care, um, childcare and nursing. Sure, but on recent trends, 1.3 million over five years seems eminently achievable. Would you agree? Well, at the moment we know that we have a, a shortage of workers to, for the jobs that are already there, but we need to continue to create jobs. I mean. This government has a track record of driving down unemployment. We inherited a 5.7% unemployment rate. We've got it down to four and there's every expectation that it's going to start with a three um, very, very shortly. Um, we've got a track record, 1.9 million jobs since we came into government and we will continue to make sure that we have the jobs for Australians, that they have access to the training so that they can take up the jobs when they occur, but also investing in those things that are actually going to create the jobs of the future, which uh, are, are through things like, you know, infrastructure, um, and defence. All right, a couple of other quick ones to cover off. Anne Rustin, uh, the Rochelle Miller Allen Tudge or Department of Finance legal settlement. Do Australians deserve to know the terms of any compensation settlement in a case that does involve a Minister of the Crown? Well, I, I think probably the most important thing in any of these situations is to um, you know, respect the confidentiality of the system and the independence of the system. Um, as uh, the Minister for Finance has, has already said, um, this has been undertaken at arm's length from the political arm of government, as it should be. Uh, it's been undertaken independently uh, and ministers of the government are not briefed on the specific yeah. details, as you would expect no, them no, not I, to be. I've heard that argument put, but I'm just wondering how the public might be able to square the finding that there was no breach of the ministerial code by Minister Tudge, but there are grounds for a workplace compo claim, given the highly visible public nature of this case, whether there might be an exception and some public accounting done for it. Well, there are two points there. One is obviously um, that the report and review that was undertaken by um, Ms Tom found that there was no breach of the ministerial standards on uh, by, by Mr Tudge, and, and I think that's a very important point. Um, but the other side of it is that the expectation around um, you know, any independent process and the confidentiality and respecting the people that are involved, um, I have no more information about the details of this case than anybody else does. And I think you know, everybody would expect that there should be no interference right. or even any information or knowledge sharing uh, in the political arm of the party when we're talking about you know, an individual workplace situation. OK, and just finally, Gillan McLaughlin in the life of the nation, a significant figure, a CEO of the AFL, walking away after eight years. How's he going to be remembered? Well, I think Gillan has done an amazing job as the head of the AFL and not the least of which is that he has presided over the establishment and the, and the blossoming of an amazing AFLW um, competition. Fantastic to be there on, uh, on the weekend to, to see my girls come home and take the, the premiership <laughs> three times out of the last four tries. So it's absolutely... I, I think, you know, Gillan will be... Uh, really missed. He's a fan has been a fantastic CEO, but he will remem be remembered as somebody who really made a difference to the game. Yep, quite a legacy. No doubt we'll be talking to you again before too long throughout this campaign. And Rustin, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Well, Labor's focus has been on health care for the start of this campaign. And today, opposition leader Anthony Albanese announced $31 million worth of Medicare bulk billing services for telehealth psychiatric consultations in rural and regional areas. At his side was Labor campaign spokesperson Katie Gallagher. She joins us from Melbourne. Katie Gallagher, thanks for your time. Hi, Fran. Thanks well, for having me on. This was Labor's big announcement today, but Anne Rustin says the government's already providing permanent universal telehealth psychiatric services to the bush. Are you really offering anything different? 
Well, absolutely, and it's it's just simply incorrect what um, Senator Rustin just said. Um, on at the end of last year, they cancelled item number two hundred and eighty-eight, uh, which cancelled the fifty percent loading for psychiatric uh, services provided by telehealth to rural and regional clients. I spoke to a psychiatrist today who told me that he'd seen a massive drop off in both referrals and people being um, patients that he was seeing uh, because of this change. The College of Psychiatry Psychiatry has been out saying that it's had devastating impact, particularly on lower income people in terms of access and affordability to mental health support. So Can I, I think you there, I think that, just to try yeah. and clarify this, is that drop off in the 50% that you're loading, does that the difference between whether psychiatrists or psychologists bulk bill or don't bulk bill? Is that what we're talking? Yes, that's right. And so what it means is if people are going to be, uh, patients are coming forward, they're going to have higher out-of-pocket costs. And that is what's been, that's why psychiatrists and GPs who are referring to psychiatry are seeing a big drop-off in people coming forward. So there isn't, I mean, one of the big issues, and this is where the government needs to get out and talk to people, doctors, nurses, patients, is Access and affordability, they are the two key issues in um, health care at the moment, particularly in regional and rural areas and particularly with mental health services. So we have listened to what the sector is saying. Uh, we have had this costed uh, and that, you know, made the announcement today and it's been universally welcomed by the people, the experts who work in the field and we think it'll be good in terms of improving access and affordability for people, vulnerable people, who need those services the most. Well, let's talk about policy costings because the government released some costings today suggesting that Labor's policies, uh, which, you know, we haven't got all the details of yet from you, but they've helpfully <laughs> tried to fill in the gaps, will cost $300 billion extra to the budget over 10 years. Is that what they'll cost? Well, this is just simply another Liberal lie, uh, Fran. Uh, it's disappointing that it's day two and we've got the Prime Minister leading out uh, focused on labour costings, uh, a labour costing lie, essentially, that he's prioritising, I think, to... Uh, you know, shy away from the fact that he doesn't have a plan. It's simply not true. It's laughable. Uh, they have this dodgy costings unit um, that they are, folk, you know, whipping up policies that we haven't announced, costing them over 10 years and not showing any details of that other than providing some comments to a newspaper. Um, it's just ridiculous. It's not true. And I am saying that in the strongest possible way. I am the finance shadow. I, I see every policy we do. I see every cost. I know exactly how much Labor is spending on policies. It's modest, it's affordable and the policies are important for the future of the country. But I can't just sit here and accept that some dodgy costing unit run by Scott Morrison and his staff is going to be taken as anything more than a, an absolute lie. Well, the way to put it to bed is to tell us what your policies will cost. If it's not 300 bill over 10 years, what is it? Well, we have been. I mean, every policy so we've announced... So what's your total? Well, ev well, Fran, I mean, forgive me, but we are in the beginning of a long campaign our costings in the usual way that has happened in every other election campaign, which is we will release them when, at the time of the policy release and then we will reconcile that with full, full release of the costings as, as the government will do. Last time they did it the second last day before the election. Um, it, will well you leave it that late? We, well, we will do it before the election, Fran. We will do it before, before the, the election. Last so, day? so people... Well, in the last few elections, ours have been out earlier than the government's. Um, we will make that decision, you know, through the campaign. But people will have that information. And I can assure you that our policies are costed uh, and they will be released in full. And we are doing that with each policy that we are releasing, as we've done with childcare, as we've done with aged care, as we've done with our free TAFE and university policies, and as we've done with our policy today. Okay, let's Fully talk costed. about childcare. It is the one, one of the ones that is out. It's costed. I think it's 5.4 billion. I think it is. Um, that's not that different to what this uh, government document puts out, mischievously over 10 years, which makes it look like a very big money. I think it's a number. I think it's 63 billion over 10 years. If it's 5. 5.4 billion a year, that's 54 billion over 10 years. Is that about right? And is that. Well, no, it's 5.4 billion over the Ford estimates. Over the for Ford a start. estimates, okay. I, yeah, over the Ford estimates. So I haven't got a clue how they got to 63 billion over 10, and nobody else does other than this dodgy costings unit at the okay. bottom of the Liberal bus. I mean, I have no idea. All right. And, and what they've done, Fran, is they've 
taken the Labor platform, which is not our policy, and then they've got some other process where they've dreamt up this massive number and then the Prime Minister's out spruiking it. I mean, surely Australians deserve better than a Prime Minister that's up to his eyeballs in this kind of, you know, student politics. It's okay. ridiculous. The, the Prime Minister today was talking up his government's management of the economy and record on jobs. He said his government will create 1.3 million jobs over three years. Is that a commitment you would match in government? Well, the Labor Party is always about growing jobs. I mean, that's been the focus of a lot of our policy announcements to date, Fran. Um, you know, it's unclear again uh, from what the government has announced today what the plan is and whether it is, as some are saying, just the uh, expected employment growth you would see uh, over the next five years. I haven't been provided with any of the detail. But we are the only, we are the only party that is releasing detailed modelling and costings for our policies, which actually include the huge job opportunities that uh, present themselves to Australia. Uh, we've been doing that from the beginning of the release of our policy. Look at our Powering Australia plan, even our childcare plan, which has a focus on enabling more women to get back okay. into work if they choose to. So we're doing the work uh, and, um, you know, we will always, always have policies that are focused on growing jobs because if we grow jobs, you know, we grow the economy, we fix the budget, we deal with some of the legacy Katie issues Gallagher, of this government. Sorry to interrupt, but, you know, yeah, we're sorry. going to run out of time and jobs sorry. is the focus for the government because they want to focus actually on Anthony Albanese's gaffe yesterday, which was a major uh, mistake at the start of this campaign. The, the Prime Minister's point, why should Australians trust Anthony Albanese with their economic futures if he doesn't really know the state of the economy anyway? Like, it's, it's unemployment is at 4%. He was a long way off at 5.4%. Australians have a right to think that they're, the guy who wants to be Prime Minister knows how many of them are out of work, don't they? Well, of course, Anthony knows how many of them are out of work, and, and well, he, he didn't. does. He didn't know. Well, well, he does, Fran. I mean, he made a mistake in a press conference yesterday, which he was very quick to own up to and take responsibility for. He didn't run away and hide. He showed up. He took responsibility. He said he should have known the number on the spot when he was asked. But I have worked like shoulder to shoulder with Anthony uh, closely for the last three years, and I've known him for longer than that. He has a very good understanding of exactly how everyday Australians are feeling at the moment with cost of living uh, issues and with wages going backwards and how hard it is. This is his life. He has grown up th well, living this life. Well, then why didn't he know the number? Do you think he didn't know it or he couldn't remember? Look, I, I think he just, on the spot, he couldn't, he couldn't answer it at the time. But absolutely, he knows and understands exactly the, the problems around unemployment, the problems around underemployment, about job insecurity. I mean, he's been driving our policy agenda, which is framing our economic plan. Of course he understands. What did you, you think, know, Katie Gallagher? You were standing behind Anthony Albanese at that moment when he couldn't remember, he came up with the wrong answer. What did you think? What went through your head at that moment? Well, I thought this would be reported on and I thought it was a difficult moment and, you know, I was then asked the question and, you know, answered the question and we moved on. And, you know, then Alvo and I, we got on and we went to our next event and, you know, he's done a number of interviews since. He doesn't shirk, you know, responsibility or leadership. He's a fine leader with all the attributes we need as Prime Minister and I think he showed that yesterday. It was a difficult day for him. He got on, he dealt with it, he turned up and he's doing it again and he'll do it every day of this campaign. Campaign. Katie Gallagher, thanks very much for joining us. Hope to speak to you again during the campaign. I'm sure we will, Fran. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so a bit to get through there, Fran. Of course, costings debates are irreconcilable, at least in the early phase of the campaign. The government trying to eke out of Labor fully bulked up costings over, over 10 years. Quite obviously, we're not going to get that. Um, that much is clear from Katie Gallagher until much later. No, we're not going to get that. And really, the government has a hide, I suppose, demanding it. This is a, a pretty kind of ridiculous figure I think the government's put out. They've tried this before. Um, it's, I guess you'd call it a scare campaign that Labor's got this sort of ginormous amount of uh, spending promises to come. You know, last election they did. Labor had a huge amount of spending and they had some tax policies to deal with it. This is the um, reverse that Anthony Albanese is bringing to the table this, this time. But yeah, we'll get the, every election, Greg, you get this debate about show us your costing, show us your costing, show us your costing. Yeah, I think they're just trying to salt the earth uh, in the early phase. Just one uh, thing 
thing we should probably flag for viewers at this point. Right as we were coming to air, Fran, a media release did land from the government. Back on the issue of floods in northern New South Wales, just throw it in now to update everyone. Uh, the Commonwealth has finally come to the party with the New South Wales government in a way that it did with the Queensland government for a greater share of split costs in flood damaged areas. Some of this is 50-50, some of it is 75 for the Commonwealth and we're told the total will be about $1.4 billion in extra It's sort of big is the question really, doesn't it, Greg, about why the Prime Minister sort of dug his heels in when he did a week or two ago, um, you know, saying, no, this is outside the envelope, you know, yeah. the, the, the New South Wales Premier there. coming forward and saying, you know, we thought you were going to cost this, you should, it doesn't matter if someone's house is demolished by floods in that electorate or this electorate. Um, and, you know, the Prime Minister came in a very quick turnabout, uh, put a hand up and said yes to Queensland, and exactly. now they're finally saying it to New South Wales. Why did Prime Minister buy himself all that pain in the meantime? I yeah. didn't understand. It wasn't clear. He wasn't going to go there. Then all of a sudden he was. Now, as we discover today, not just with one state, but with both. So, anyway, that's a bit of news that broke right around the time we went to air. Fran, we might push on because we will be seeking, and already have, in fact, to cover key contests throughout this campaign. Uh, all elections, once upon a time, used to start with discussions involving two words, Eden and Monero. Now, these days, that seat's lost its bellwether status, being held by Labor in opposition. But sitting MP Christy McBain is on the tightest of margins trying to defend her seat. She joins us now from Chura Beach. Christy, thanks for coming back. Can I just start on this uh, mental health announcement that has been made by your party today? Katie Gallagher just making some points. But how acute is this need in the lived experience uh, after the bushfires in particular. And that's my intro, is it? Okay, I'm gonna... Yeah, look, it's been incredibly difficult for uh, a whole range of people to access services, uh, especially mental health services across Eden Monero. Uh, and uh, when those cuts were made to telehealth through uh, Medicare, it was incredibly frustrating for a, a whole bunch of people who were relying on those services um, post droughts, post bushfires, post COVID. Um, you know, it's a long way to access a lot of services when you live in regional Australia. Uh, so those Medicare rebate telehealth um, uh, appointments are always welcome because otherwise, you know, we could be travelling, you know, uh, an eight-hour return trip or more uh, yeah. to access services that are... Uh, you know, bread and butter for those people living in the cities. But is the difference not receiving them or not paying the gap between, you know, the scheduled fee and, well, not bulk billing effectively is the question? Look, anything that goes towards assisting uh, regional Australians access services are always appreciated. You know, when I'm around talking in my community, uh, we've got people that are struggling to get a GP appointment to start with. Uh, you know, we have people that are travelling uh, hundreds of kilometres to receive any services. So, you know, getting some rebates uh, through telehealth is, is much appreciated. I've got, I've got people in my community at this point in time struggling to access services and when they do access them, they're required to pay large sums of money. So uh, this announcement goes a long way to actually assisting regional Australians. All right, I want to ask you a bit about your local campaign because it's going to be distinctively different uh, second time around. Can I just qu uh, quickly, though, cover off the news of the day from yesterday that lingers into today? That is Anthony Albanese's unemployment gaffe. Um, has that registered or economic management credentials uh, registered on the ground in these last 24 hours? Look, people across Eden Monero want to actually have a, a political uh, debate about what the policies of the major parties are. I mean, if we're going to be reporting on these gotcha questions, uh, then I think the big question should be for the Prime Minister who said he'd done eight budgets, four as Treasurer and three as Prime Minister, because... Uh, my own kids know that that equals seven, not eight. So, you know, these kind of things being reported on really detracts from what everyday Australians are asking. And what they're asking is, in the next term of government, will my life be better? And I think the Labor Party has struck those policies after listening to people right across this country talk about the major issues that they have in front of them. You know, the increasing cost of childcare, the increasing cost 
of, of petrol, uh, yeah. the increasing cost of electricity, the increasing cost of actually trying to access internet uh, services because right across my electorate, these are the big issues for people. You know, we've got people that can't get mobile phone reception where they are. We have people that can't access additional days at work because they can't afford the childcare costs. We've got people that can't see a GP because there's none available to them. Yeah. Uh, these are the big issues we need to be talking about. All right, and they're the um, issues you know, you'll get to prosecute. A press conference prosecute. doesn't matter. Yeah, sure, and they're, they're the issues you'll get to prosecute, Christy McBain, throughout your campaign. Can I just ask you, though, what is different in a general election campaign? It seems in the by-election context you had the eyes of Australia and the support of a party right behind you. Now you're one of 151. Um, what's different about the nature of, of your work over the next five weeks or so? Oh, look, obviously, in a general election campaign, uh, there are seats being con contested right across the country as well as uh, Senate spots. Um, there is obviously a lot more work going into this um, uh, in terms of, you know, there are people contesting these seats right across the country. Uh, for me, though, it's business as usual. You know, I've got an electorate that's 42,000 square kilometres. Uh, and in the 21 months I've been in the job, I've travelled over 90,000 Ks listening to what people are asking for. And I think that's where the Labor Party has you know, hit the nail on the head in this election so far. They're talking about the policies that people are asking that need to be adjusted. They need their lives improved. Over the last decade of this Liberal government, um, I don't, I'm not sure that anyone's lives have improved. There's been no changes to their lives. They've gone backwards in many, sen in many senses in regards to their real wages. Mm. Um, you know, we need a government that listens, um, that cares for people and that actually wants to get things right. Yeah, well, we'll uh, try and check in with you and, of course, in the interests of balance with some of your other opponents in the electorate of Eden Monero. But Christy McBain, thanks for joining us again on Afternoon Briefing today. Thank you. Health services were part of Labor's agenda today. The opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, announcing plans to restore affordable telehealth psychiatric consultations for people in rural and regional Australia. As we've watched some of those regional communities across the country devastated by fire and floods and dealing with the pandemic, the mental health needs have never been more acute. I'm joined now from Lismore by Tony Davies, CEO of the community services organisation Social Futures. Tony, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Good afternoon, Frank. Tony, your organisation supports people in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, so really heavily hit by these floods. How acute are the mental health needs in your area after these floods? The, any, any natural disaster creates serious mental health issues. And after the 2017 floods five years ago, we saw there was a, a really long tail for people with mental health needs. Uh, a lot of people, particularly those displaced for a long time, living with post-traumatic stress disorder for a number of years. What we've had this time is a region-wide flood where you know, not just Lismore, not just uh, the big towns, but the whole region had communities devastated by flood and a lot of people who were facing uh, loss of life. I've got friends, colleagues and, and you know, people that we work with were saying they thought they would die on the night of the big flood. Uh, thousands of people have had that experience. So we know that there will be an extraordinary impact on people's mental health over the longer term. Uh, and of course, they're displaced. They, they don't know where they're going to live uh, for the medium term, let alone the long term. So potentially, uh, there's, there's an extraordinary need out there and it's building. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the sort of mental health support you have currently in the community, whether any of them are able to operate even yet after the floods, and what's the gap, you think? Look, we, we, we and other programs were able to get going really fast. Uh, we were able to set up temporary premises uh, and the, the Primary Health Network certainly assisted with that. Uh, and our homelessness services, a range of services, even though our staff were affected, 10% of our staff in Lisbon had flood water in their houses. Uh, uh, they were able to get out and about and, and to go to recovery centres and start helping people. Uh, but really, that was immediate help. What we're going to need over the longer term is access to that professional therapeutic support. And 
we have workforce issues. We, we had all of these issues before the flood, massive homelessness and a range of, of, of uh, issues in our communities that came with that. Uh, and we have lost a lot of housing, people are displaced, so there's a lot more demand. Yeah. So with so, that anxiety, we need action. So, Tony, in terms of action, you got a bit from Labor on the campaign trail today. They promised this $31 million package to what they, the words they use, restore bulk billing to telehealth uh, psychiatric consultations in regional rural Australia. Is that the sort of service that will help plug this gap? Is, is that anywhere near enough? And do the workforce issues, you know, are the psychiatrists and the psychologists there on the other end of the telehealth call? Uh it's part of the solution, it's not the whole solution, and it's great. Look, the more ways we can get uh, psychiatrists, psychologists to provide services to our communities, the better. I think it's really important that we uh, ensure it gets to all the areas we need. For example, Tweed, uh, which was an area heavily hit by floods, both uh, in the hinterland and also on the coast, uh, doesn't necessarily meet the classification to get those rural tele services. So we need to ensure that they're available, uh, that actually they can be bulk billed in all the areas where people are affected by flood. And we definitely need more of it. It's not the complete solution, no, but really communities at the moment desperately need the help. So anything they can get is going to be gratefully received. What are the consequences, Tony, of not getting the help? Look, after the 2017 floods, there was a study that said, you know, people who were dislocated for a long period of time, 47% uh, of those people had post-traumatic stress disorder. And two years on, uh, they, they were sitting at similar levels. Now, if you have some serious mental health issues as a result of the traumatic events, that can affect your ability to work. It can affect relationships. Uh, it, it really uh, can have a terrible effect on someone's life course. So we really need that support. We know, of course, as well, that housing is going to be fundamental. Really, we need to get the housing situation sorted absolutely first and then get these mental health services in place so that people can actually work through the trauma and, and get themselves into a better place. Housing is so critical, isn't it? I mean, just finally, it's stating the bleeding obvious. I suppose that while telehealth might be terrific um, and give people access to psych services wherever they are, it's hard to have a telehealth conference if you don't have a house, isn't it? If you don't have a home. Look, absolutely. And that's always been one of the things about technology solutions. It's part of the solution in, in the regions, but the internet is not great. And with the floods, we saw major breakdowns in the internet. But look, housing, I mean, I'm... I really would call upon both sides of politics in an election campaign to commit to a significant ramp up of social housing. That'll be needed. We need proper preparation in advance for natural disasters because with climate change now dictating the quality of life for people on lower incomes and, and moderate incomes in regional Australia, we need all of those things in place. And then we do need a mental health service system that can respond quickly and effectively. Tony, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, friend. This elect through this election race, parties are walking a fine tightrope of appealing to voters in key seats they need to win, while not alienating voters in other parts of the country. And already in this election campaign, some of the divisions in the coalition are on show. Let's bring in Casey Briggs now. Casey, what have you spotted so far? G'day, Fran. Well, if you talk to, you would well know, if you talk to politicians for long enough, you, you, there's a very high chance you're going to hear a couple of phrases. One, uh, the Liberal Party is a broad church. Uh, two, disunity is death. And already in this campaign, we're starting to see uh, some instances where that broad church is creating some disunity in the campaign uh, messaging in different parts of the country and from different uh, parts of the party. So the Prime Minister was in Nowra yesterday, the key seat of Gilmore, uh, which Labor currently holds, by the way. And while he was there, he was asked about his Liberal candidate for Warringah and some of her views. She formed, uh, a, 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 a founded a, a campaign organisation that campaigns against trans women being able to play in women's sporting leagues. Here's what he said. 
think I've already conveyed my own personal view on these matters and uh, I welcome Catherine Deeve's uh, selection and I was very pleased to play a, a role in that. I, I think she's raised very important issues and I think Claire Chandler has also been very outspoken and brave on these issues and, and I share their views. So uh, pretty uh, full-throated support there from the PM of Senator Claire, Chandler, Claire Chandler's uh, private senator's bill that would uh, allow sporting organisations to ban transgender women from uh, playing in single-sex leagues. But it's fair to say that is not a view that's necessarily held by everyone in the coalition. For example, The Guardian's reported today that some Liberal moderates are unhappy that this issue has even come up on the campaign trail, a bit uncomfortable by it. Senator Andrew Bragg uh, telling the outlet that he doesn't see that there's any deficiencies in the law and doesn't see why anything would need to change, although it must be said he was a little bit more measured when he spoke to Patricia Carvelis on RM Breakfast this morning. Well, I mean, people are entitled to their views. That's I mean, not my question. Church. Yeah, that people are entitled well, to it. Do you think it's a good idea? As I said, it's a detailed bill. It needs to go to a committee and the committee can look at all the evidence. So not exactly full uh, support there for what the PM is saying. And this may well be an issue that, you know, this kind of culture war issue that that has become doesn't particularly play well in some of the key seats that we're talking about. Indeed, in Warringah, the seat that uh, the Liberal candidate has uh, founded, this campaign group, on this very issue, uh, this, um, this, uh, this candidate... Um, uh, this candidate has... Um, on her Liberal Party bio, hasn't mentioned this uh, issue whatsoever. Uh, it's a completely blank slate uh, when it comes to that issue. It may well be, Fran, that, you know, on the electoral uh, maths of this seat, the fact that these are the 2019 results, this is not really an issue that they, you know, want to come up. I think you might be right there, Casey. And, uh, you know, we've seen this last election. Labor had trouble on this front, didn't they? Not, not the culture war so much, but around climate policy. In fact, Labor's post-mortem suggested that Bill Shorten sort of having one message on, on climate policy and climate change and coal in Queensland and another one in some of those seats in the leafy suburbs of Melbourne and Sydney really did damage. And on that front too, the, the coalition's got a few discrepancies, shall we say. Yeah, let's jump just from Warringah down across the Sydney Harbour to uh, the seat of Wentworth, where the Liberals' main challenger is independent Allegra Spender. She's running on a platform largely centred on climate uh, action. The Liberal MP on Sunday, Dave Sharma, published a video online where he was really stressing local issues and his commitment to action on climate change and renewable energy. Have a listen secured a commitment to net zero, billions in funding for renewable energy and stopped the offshore oil and gas licence, HEP 11. If elected, I'll continue to push for tangible outcomes, not just headlines. So that's Dave Sharma in the seat of Wentworth in urban Sydney, but let's just go a bit further north to regional Queensland and specifically the seat of Flynn, uh, which is held by the government at the moment. The new candidate for the seat is Colin Boyce. He has a very different message he would like people in his electorate to hear. This is what is paying for us, our education, our health and emergency services. It is underpinning the, the economy of Australia. So, um, by the way, uh, uh, Colin Boyce ran a Facebook ad here. About 80% of the people that saw that ad were men in his uh, electorate. But it really sort of underlines some of the issues here. We've got one government, we've got two different messages. Uh, a government keen to keep seats in Queensland as well as some of those urban seats in, in the city uh, centres and quite a kind of road to... Uh, walk and Fran, you mentioned some of the issues that Labor had e e three years ago with its election campaign on this very issue. Let's not, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty likely and we've seen already that inconsistency of messaging among the Labor camp. Just staying in Flynn for a second because um, coal and hard hats are a bipartisan issue in Flynn. This is the Labor candidate, uh, the Mayor of Gladstone, very much standing up for the coal industry. So the same sorts of issues that Labor had three years ago with an inconsistent message from state to state may well be playing out this time as well. Cole, uh, Casey, Cole and hard hats. I think I'll get you to do one of those magic graphs you do about where all the hard hats are through this campaign. Thanks very much, Casey.
And Greg, you know exactly that, isn't it? Like how many hard hats, how many high vis yeah. vests, and you could do some kind of tracking of the issues, I think, if you did that, Casey, with his magic map. It's a useful service going to the granular detail and the discrepancies, in fact, between uh, what is messaged nationally by the leaders, but then the latitude that local members and candidates are given. I mean, it looks like it's pretty wide, at least on the example cited there by Casey. I suppose we could fairly observe, Fran, that uh, MPs may do whatever it takes uh, within some boundaries, of course, but uh, messaging it's, it's in North Queensland is so different. It's hard to know how you can so keep your message, yeah. though, within your boundary, given sort of the reach of social media. So, you know, he mentioned Dave Sharma there in Wentworth. He might have his message that he's trying to narrow cast to his electorate, but it will go wider and therefore, isn't it inevitably going to create some conflict perhaps up in Queensland, for instance, which is exactly what really bedevilled um, Bill Shorten last time for Labor. Yeah, or if we are all up to our jobs, it's when the strictly local uh, then goes national and is looped back for exactly. a leader to account for it. That's when it gets truly problematic for them. So we'll keep an eagle eye on that. I know you've got to go very shortly, Fran, but uh, look, just one final observation. This private senator's bill that Claire, Claire Chandler is finding some support from the Prime Minister with, uh, it's not quite clear what it is Scott Morrison might do to put his shoulder behind that. It does sound like they're going to sponsor it in for further examination in the parliament, though. It, is, it, is that your take? It certainly does sound like that. I mean, the Prime Minister says he'll give it his full support, and you imagine that means the government endorsing the private member's bill or backing the private member's bill. And as Casey was pointing out, you know, Andrew Bragg, Senator Andrew Bragg, Liberal Senator, uh, quoted in The Guardian, pointing out that we already have laws that should deal with this and that are dealing with this within the sports clubs. Um, Simon Birmingham was uh, on RM Breakfast this morning suggesting that, you know, anything would have to go through the parliamentary processes of committees, for instance. So he didn't seem to be embracing this, uh, you know, a culture a war issue at all enthusiastically. He's a key moderate, of course, in the, within the Liberal Party um, room. So uh, I think it is interesting. The Prime Minister has really not stepped away from this at all, though. Every time it's come into his orbit, he's given it a shove forward. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know what his uh, internal... what late Liberal Party internal polling might be telling him yeah, on this and it, where it's playing. Exactly. And he is at least suggesting that he might have something further to say in the course of this campaign. So we'll keep an eye on that. Obviously, he hasn't been chastened in any way by uh, what became of the religious discrimination stuff, which got quite messy indeed in the tail end of the last parliament. But uh, one for us to watch too, Fran. We're going to have to let you go at that point. I think you need to move on. We'll see you again tomorrow, Fran. Thanks, Fran Greg. Kelly joining us from Sydney. Now, before we go, speaking of politicians trying to sing with one voice or otherwise, they pretty much adopt a do-whatever-it- takes approach to convincing voters that they want to be in tune with them during campaigns. And in the seat of Cowan in Western Australia, where Labor's Anne Ali is on a tight margin, the sitting member's done exactly that today, karaoke style. Maybe you can judge for yourself just how in tune Anne Ali really is. I reckon if you've got them dancing in the aisles, then it might just be working to some degree for you. And, uh, and Ali giving it a red hot crack there in the West. That's it for Afternoon Briefing uh, this Tuesday. Fran and I will be both back with you again tomorrow. Same time. See you then.